Hey everyone, uh, I know it's been a while, uh, but now we're moving on to our next section here uh, in this AP Biology course, and we're moving on to chapter six, uh, all about the cell. Um, so the first section, 6.1, is about <clears throat> different techniques that are used to look at cells given how small they are. Um, so let's just jump right in and get into this unit about cells. So the reason why we care about cells in biology is because as you probably can imagine, uh, cells are the basic units of life, they're the smallest units of life, and all larger organisms are actually made out of cells. Um, it's one of the definitions of a living organism that um, it's made up of cells. So, let's see. Um, in general, when we talk about cells, um, we can talk about, about them as the simplest uh, collection of matter, right? So they are um, made up of different elements combined in very specific ways. Um, and they have particular functions depending on their structure, so depending on organelles that they have. So, for example, you have cells that have chloroplasts in them, and they will perform photosynthetic functions. They have a lot of mitochondria. Um, they have other specific functions. So the, the structure of the cell um, is always related to its function, and that's just an overall theme in biology uh, that structure and function are related. Um, and there's one more kind of introductory point um, about cells, and that is that all cells are very similar to each other. They might have differences in their structure, but overall, like if you look at the cell you know, of one human compared to another human, they will have they they will be indistinguishable essentially. And even if you look at the cell of one animal compared to another animal, sometimes they're almost impossible to tell apart. Um, and this has to do with the fact that all cells um, are essentially related to each other according to the theory of evolution. Um, and they have descended from a common ancestor. And that's, um, we're kind of going to get into that in the next section, but uh, that's always interesting to think about. So since uh, cells are so small, biochemists need to use tools to study them. Um, and we're just going to talk very briefly about the, the kind of two categories or like three categories of tools uh, that biochemists or that uh, biologists might use to study cells. And the first one, which you have probably... Um, uh, heard of before um, is this notion of microscopy. Um, and so microscopy is simply a method that is used by uh, scientists, by people who are studying cells um, or living organisms to uh, magnify and visualize uh, cells or their structure or parts of, you know, things that are relating to cells. Um, and in microscopy there are three kind of main ideas. Uh, the magnification, which is how big your um, image is compared to the object's real size, right? So you can magnify something ten times, you could magnify something a hundred times, or what have you. Uh, another kind of aspect of microscopy is the notion of resolution, right? So you can have images um, that are more clear or less clear depending on uh, the conditions. And lastly, when we talk about images, we talk about their contrast, which I'm sure that you guys are familiar with when we talk about like filters on Instagram, etc. Right? Contrast is simply um, a way of describing the difference between um, the colors in the images, like how much those differences are apparent. And so these three uh, aspects of microscopy can be manipulated when we're looking at images of cells, as well as any other photographs. Um, so those are kind of three ideas. Uh, and let's take a look at the different types of... Uh, the different types of imaging techniques that can be used to look at different sizes of specimens, right? So this is just a scale that you have in the textbook and it's this idea, you know, some things you can look at without any um, tools. You can just look at them with an unaided eye or a naked eye, right? So you can see things all the way up until you get to, you know, less than a millimeter. Once you get less than a millimeter, even if you have great sight, things are going to be harder to see. And that's when the light microscope is most useful. So light microscopy is, um, and we'll talk about this afterwards, is one type of microscopy technique that is used to see small things, but not the smallest kinds of things, right? So you can look at a whole cell. Um, you may be able to look at some bacteria as well. But then once you get to some smaller bacteria, the light microscopy uh, magnification is not strong enough for you to 
look at it in a meaningful kind of way. And that's when the electron microscope um, comes in and is a very useful tool. And this, this uh, tool is used to look at very small um, organisms. So you might look at bacteria. You could also look at cells um, and get like more details of those cells that you would otherwise be able to see with a light microscope. Um, so generally you have better resolution with light microscopes, but you can also see things that are smaller like uh, viruses, or you can look at structures inside of the cell like the ribosomes or even proteins. Um, and, and, and we can almost get down uh, to the atomic scale. Right, so these different tools are useful for different things that you would be looking at. Um, so let's talk about light mi microscopy really quickly. Uh, so light microscopy is probably the, the type of microscopy that you're most familiar with. Sometimes it's called LM and there are different like letters that come before it depending on what kinds of uh, light microscopy um, you're doing. Uh, and it's a really useful tool for studying living cells. Um, and that's a key difference between light microscopy and electron uh, scanning electron or trans transmission electron microscopes. Um, light microscopy is useful for looking at cells that are still alive. So if you want to see what a cell is doing, how it's going through mitosis or what have you, you're going to have to use some form of light microscopy. Um, it can magnify quite a bit. It can magnify up to a thousand times. Um, generally, when you do light microscopy, you can you know you can look at the cell as it is, um, but it's helpful to stain your specimen before you look at it so that you can see different parts of the cell with greater contrasts. Um, in generally, um, in generally, <laughs> in general, uh, organelles can be hard to see with light microscopy. You can see a nucleus, maybe you'll see like the endoplasmic reticulum kind of, but it's not at a very high quality. Um, so that's light microscopy. Uh, in the textbook, they go over some examples of light microscopy, um, different techniques that are used, right? So the images can be processed in all kinds of way. Colors can be added. Contrast can be adjusted so that you can see more details. Um, the point here, though, that I want to make is that this is a field that is developing very quickly because it's an essential part of biochemistry um, and biology in general. And so the examples that are here uh, you know, they're, they're, they're examples, um, but they may not be like the most cutting edge technology. If you want to know more about this, then you should um, investigate that on the internet. Um, I don't think the textbook has the most updated versions of everything. But so in general, when we talk about um, light microscopy, bright field is just this idea that you're looking at something, there's no stain on it. Um, or you can have like unstained light, uh, bright field and you have stained bright field. So here's an image of a cell I have no idea what kind of cell, but it's a cell. Um, and you can tell, you know, you know, maybe you can make out that this is like a nucleus right here. There's some other things that are floating around there. You can see kind of the edges of the cell. Uh, but without a stain, uh, you don't have a lot of information about the cell. And so here you can see it's been stained by some blue pigment and the dark kind of circular part in the center is a, is a nucleus uh, because chromatin catches on to a lot of dyes really well. Other examples um, would be phase contrast, right, or differential uh, interference contrast. All of these techniques um, take the image that you have, whether it's stained or it's not stained, um, generally it is stained, and then they, you know, the image is processed in some ways to, to bring out the details that you want to focus on, um, and that's done on the computer. Uh, another important technique in biology is fluorescence techniques. Um, so the, the cells are stained uh, with specific chemicals uh, that have a fluorescent components to them so that when you shine a particular type of light, then those, those molecules will fluoresce, they will light up. And what's amazing about that is that um, you, can, you can make molecules that stick to particular parts of the cell, right? So this molecule, there's a molecule here that is sticking uh, to, to something, on the pro uh, something on the nucleus, which is probably a protein receptor, and it fluoresces a particular color. So it actually fluoresces the color of something specific. It's not just binding to anything, and that's a really useful technique. And that can be combined with a confocal technique, um, and what that means is that you take the image and you can like stack it. You can take like many, many images uh, kind of looking at the specimen at different layers, and then you stack them and it kind of gives like a three-dimensional uh, image, which uh, is really useful for getting a sense of um, a more uh, I guess like a three-dimensional idea of what you're looking at.
So that's just kind of really quickly light microscopy. Again, if you want to know more about this, you really should, you know, investigate uh, these things on the internet. I gave you a link later on to this website for Zeiss, which is a company that makes all of these tools or one of the companies that makes these tools. They have some great tutorials and I'll show you guys that later. Um, so that's light microscopy. And then on the flip side, um, or on the other end, we have um, electron microscopy. Um, and there, there are many different types of electron microscopy. Um, there's scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy are the two ones that we're going to look at. Um, scanning electron microscopy is generally more useful um, for looking at the outside, at the outside of um, a specimen, whereas transmission electron microscopy is more useful for actually getting onto the inside of your specimen. The key here with the scanning electron microscopy is that you can't really use it to look at living cells because the, the way that you process the cells in order to look at them under these microscopes is not great conditions for cells to survive in and they die. Um, so in, in general actually looking at living cells under a microscope is hard enough as is because you have to make sure you have the right pH and that the cells have all the other conditions that they need. Do they have nutrients? Do they have, you know, so it's cells are just impossible to take care of um, <laughs> as is uh, and so putting them through the the processing for electron microscopes doesn't do them any good. Uh, so Electron microscopy is good for looking at cells that are already dead or at specimens that are not living to begin with also. Um, so the, the scanning electron microscope images that you've probably seen before are these beautiful, typically um, black and white images that have very high resolution um, of quite small things. Uh, so here's a scanning electron microscope image of cilia, right? Um, and here you can see uh, it's like a slice um, of the of a probably not the same specimen, but the same type of specimen, um, and you have uh, again a lot of detail in this image, and they're black and white. And sometimes these images can be colored after they've been taken, um, so you'll see images of that are clearly scanning electron microscope images, but they're colored, and that means that they've been colored by someone after the image was taken. So that is essentially the two ways that um, you can look at. Um, cells or cell components. Again, so this website, let's see if I have it open. I think I did. Yeah. Um, so this website uh, is a company that makes a lot of these imaging tools. Uh, but what's cool is that if you go onto the website, they have like a section that's like learn more. And it, it gives you some tutorials, pretty like basic tutorials, but informational nonetheless, about things that are related to microscopy, right? And so um, I, you know, if you, if you want to know more about this, uh, I think this would be a good source of information to, to learn more about exactly how this microscopy works. I don't think you need to know that for the exam, um, but, you know, it's always exciting to learn about things that you're interested in. So, uh, so those are imaging techniques. Another example in the textbook that's given uh, for tools that biochemists or biologists use to look at cells is um, cell fractioning um, or cell fractionation. And essentially what this technique entails is separating things in the cell using density. So you take your tissue sample, let's say you want to look at like liver cells, um, and specifically you want to look at the uh, mitochondria in the liver cells, right? So you take the tissues, the, the liver cells, you make it into a smoothie, you call that a homogenate because it's a homogeneous mixture, um, and then you centrifuge it. And what centrifuges do is they just, you put the sample in, you know, you can balance it out, and it spins at a particular uh, amount of rotations per minute, and uh, things will separate based on density. The things that have a greater density will come to the bottom, and they will form what we call this pellet. Um, and the, the surface, the, the, the upper part of it, which we call the supernatant, um, we'll have, you know, other materials in it, uh, then, but mostly also cytoplasm, the, the cell kind of juice. And you can, like, you can do this as many times as you want, right? You can spin it down, make a pellet, take off the supernatant, and spin that down again, and it'll separate it again. And um, at different uh, rotations per minute for different periods of time, again, these techniques depend exactly on what you're trying to separate out. But the idea is that you can separate things in a cell using the density and rotation. 
Uh, you, you can't go into a cell and be like, let me just take out this mitochondria. Like, that's never going to happen. Uh, so this is one way that is a useful technique for separating things that you want to look at in a cell. So that's essentially it for the 6.1 uh, just introduction to the, the biochemical techniques. Again, there are many techniques, uh, and these are just examples of some. And uh, if you want to know more about different techniques, uh, you can always scope it out on the internet and find other uh, examples. So here is a practice question. So if um, <clears throat> you look at a sample under a light microscope versus an electron microscope, uh, how would you, how do the staining techniques compare? So take a moment to think about that and then I'll go over my answer. So when we look under a light microscope, Right when we look at the staining, um, usually you have to stain sample before imaging. I'm sorry, my handwriting is so bad. <laughs> this is stain sample before imaging, whereas with an electron microscope uh, technique, the staining happens after the image is taken. Right, so you actually color the image, not the sample. Here is another practice question. So let's say you want to look at um, a living white blood cell, and you also want to look at the surface texture of a hair. What type of microscope technique would you use for each? So... For the living white blood cell, you probably remember that you need to use light microscopy techniques. That's the only technique that you can use to study living cells. Um, so you're probably going to have to use one of those techniques. Whereas hair, um, even though hair is quite big, if you want to actually look at the details of the surface texture of the hair, a great technique for that would be an electron microscope if you have access to it. You can look at hair under a light microscope, uh, but you're not going to get the same level of detail that you would with an electron microscope because you have higher magnification with an electron microscope. So that's all for now. Um, I will have the next video up soon. Uh, and that one will be all about eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells and organelles. So look forward to it.